Salam alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Now I'm delighted to be joined today by Sir Alan Duncan, who is the uh, former Minister for International Development and recently appointed government special envoy to Yemen and to Oman. Sir Alan is a respected voice in the Middle East, within the Conservative Party especially, and has travelled extensively in the region. In July 2014 this year, Alan was knighted, becoming a Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Salam alaikum, Sir Alan, and welcome to Islam Channel. Thank you. Now, you are scheduled to deliver a speech which has been described by the chief political correspondent of the Daily Telegraph as beyond doubt the most powerful and probably the most important speech made about the Middle East by any British politician in the past 25 years. Is that how you see it and why? <laughs> well, that's quite a big claim, but what it is an attempt to do is to analyse dispassionately the fundamental principles which underpin the Middle East so-called peace process. And inevitably, in the Arab-Israeli dispute, people say, well, you're shooting us, you're shooting us, and you get into this tit-for-tat argument all the time, which is not very informative. People just adopt their positions and have a pop at each other. But what I'm trying to do is to go back to the fundamental point and say, what is right and what is wrong in this? And in my view, the fundamental issue that is wrong is the gradual annexation of Palestinian land by the Israelis. The settlements policy, and it is a policy, is morally indefensible. It is illegal, it's not acceptable. And so long as Israel continues to support its settlement activity, it forfeits its moral position as a democracy. It, because it's, it's doing things which democratic countries should not do. The rule of law should always come first in a democracy. And if all Israel does is ignore the rule of law and flout it, then they, I think, at the same time, forfeit their moral authority. Now, those are very big, very bold uh, words that you're using, ones that are not necessarily echoed by members of the current government's cabinet. Um, uh, I think it's fair enough to say that with there being a free vote this afternoon on uh, Palestinian statehood, um, Britain abstained uh, from the vote in 2012, the UN vote. The US, the United States, voted against it, referring to it as unfortunate and counterproductive, and, and it suggested that it placed further obstacles in the path to peace. It declared that the grand pronouncements would soon fade and that the Palestinian people would wake up tomorrow and find out that little had been done to change their lives, save that the prospects of peace had been receded. Um, not surprising that the UK have echoed that sentiment. Do you feel that the UK has essentially been a poodle to US whims and Israeli whims? Well, the problem with choosing a time to recognize the state of Palestine is that there's always a reason not to. And there was a reason of sorts in 2012 because Secretary Kerry was really valiantly trying to get some kind of agreement between the two. And, you know, there was a chance of getting it and he was doing the right thing in the right way. And so there's always an argument saying don't rock the boat. But the trouble is, there's always an argument to say don't rock the boat, and the peace process is not a process at all unless you look at the fundamental principle underneath it. And all of the time these supposed negotiations were going on, and I have to say I think they were very one-sided, with the Palestinians offering lots of uh, helpful conditions, but they didn't get a very serious response, is that the principle gets lost. And the principle is that all the time the Israelis are gradually taking over more and more of the West Bank. Uh, and it does not belong to them. It's not their country. And so I think that there comes a point where you have to say, of course we want negotiations. Of course there are going to be land swaps. Of course we want some kind of uh, agreement to be reached between the two parties. But you cannot, in doing that, ignore the fundamental point of principle, which is that the gradual annexation of Palestinian land is immoral and it is illegal. It's illegal because it's wrong under every single uh, resolution of the United Nations. Uh, it's wrong in international law. And how can a democracy say that they are a true democracy, upholding all the decencies of a democracy, unless they behave within the rule of law? Now, in your speech this week, I understand, of course, I've not read it personally, but I've heard reports of it, you will make it clear that Britain has a moral duty to recognise Palestinian as a state and make the point that shame has been brought on the UK by its decision to stand back from taking a decision on that issue, given its historic responsibility in the Middle East. 
uh, it suggested an increasing number of Conservative MPs, including one or two Cabinet Ministers, share your opinions on that issue. Do you detect, detect a genuine momentum of shift in government foreign policy on this issue? Well, I think it's moving. This has always been a matter of justice and of the difference between right and wrong. But increasingly, as injustice is meted out to Palestinian, to Palestinians, it becomes a greater issue of justice. Therefore, I think we do have a moral obligation. Otherwise, uh, the Israeli land grab will become irreversible. Look, we recognized Israel after the 48 Civil War in 1950 from the UK without determining its borders or saying what its capital would be. And on exactly those same terms, you could equally recognize the state of Palestine today, after which negotiations would still continue. You'd still have to sort some things out. But it gives them the dignity of statehood, which is theirs by right. And I defy you to identify anywhere else in the world where there is a populous area, technically in law, not disputed, which is not allowed to call itself a country. Now, are you essentially referring to 1967 borders? I mean, the US president makes ref made reference in one or two speeches. It's the very furthest I think he's gone to say suggest that there should be a recognition of those. And how realistic is it to, even if we weren't to take account of recent proclamations of expansions of settlement activity, uh, to rehouse half a million plus Israelis in order to respect somewhere close to those borders? Look, Israel is a state. No one should challenge its right to exist. And the starting point for its borders are the legal ones which were determined in 1967. But everyone accepts that there are going to be land swaps and those borders are going to expand. I mean, they've already pushed a, an illegal war outside the 1967 borders uh, and have cut through a lot of Palestinian lands uh, improperly. But everyone accepts there are going to be uh, swaps. But if we don't recognize a Palestinian state, and if we don't make a stand on settlements, we are effectively endorsing illegality. And as each day goes by, as they build more and more, the facts on the ground change and the illegal occupation, not occupation, the illegal inhabitation of uh, settlements in the West Bank becomes entrenched forever. Now, some of them are going to stay. Of course they are. Everyone accepts that. But I think if we don't recognize the Palestinian state and if we don't make a stand on settlements, Israel bit by bit is going to get more of the land and we'll reach the point which they've probably reached already, which is to say we don't actually need an agreement because we're going to get away with this and in 30 years' time we'll have the whole lot anyway. So why bother? Now, I know that the central core of your speech is going to be focused on the Israeli land grab, to use a term that's been uttered. Um, just last week, I know that the, there was a historic visit, I think the first in many years, of the uh, UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office Secretary of State, Tobias Elwood, and he reiterated the UK's commitment to uh, its uh, supporting Palestine with a spend of in excess of £20 million. Um, in a statement published only this morning, Desmond Swain, the development minister, said, and I'm quoting him, it's not an option for Britain to be asked to pick up the pieces again in Gaza. And he warned that further British aid was contingent on political progress in the region. Um, he said that this must be the last time that we see Gaza being rebuilt. There's a need for bold political steps from all parties has never been more apparent. Do you agree with him? Well, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, I think you can put a number of different meanings on what he said. And I, if I understand him correctly, I share the view that we don't want this to happen again. And whereas I think it was totally wrong and indeed stupid for Hamas to fire rockets uh, at Israel. I think the response has been seriously disproportionate, but of course it's been destructive, and we don't want to see that destruction happening again. And in Cairo, the money raised exceeded $5 billion. Well, let's build a good Gaza where people can live sensibly in peace, but as part of a Palestinian state. And so do you think Desmond Swain, when he was making this statement, do you think he actually was referring to a, a, a cessation of settlement building uh, and a cessation of assaults, which seemed to be a sort of regular cycle or, on the region? I noticed, for example, that Lord Paddy Ashton, who I spoke to about a week or so ago, um, he urged, and I'm quoting him, some action at last uh, to extinguish the burning coal at the heart of the Middle Eastern 
conflagration. He, the illegal Israeli settlements on the West Bank, he said, would strangle at birth the only peace Israel and the Palestinian can have, one based on a two-state solution. I mean, are you, do, you, do you feel that he's hit the nail on the head? Yes, I think Lord Ashdown is right. Um, and I think he understands this and courageously says what he thinks. And I think more of us need to do that. And the fundamental point I make is that anyone who thinks that settlements are okay puts themselves outside the boundaries of democratic decency and international law. And it means that they are the extremists. I think it's fair to say that you're, you're nece not necessarily totally in line with current government policy on this issue. I, just over a month ago, Baroness Saeed Avasi, former minister at the Foreign Office, who quit her ministerial post uh, after issuing a statement condemning the government's failure to take an appropriate stance over Israel's actions in Gaza. She said that the government's approach to the conflict between Israel and Palestine was morally indefensible. He said there's a lack of political will and the government's moral compass was missing. Is the UK government, as I've sort of hinted before, simply kowtowing to whatever the Israeli lobby and the US uh, are putting forward as a strategy? Well, I'd rather not call our policy morally indefensible because our policy is to say that settlements are illegal. But I think the continuing settlements policy of the Israeli state is morally indefensible. And I think the debate we need to have, perhaps on the back of the speech I'm giving, uh, is that you cannot just watch and use words to condemn. There will have to be consequences and greater toughness. And I'd like to see the United States flexing its muscles more, because without United States influence on this, the Israelis will just continue to do what they do. And I think that too much of American politics is controlled by Israeli supporting money. And that, I think, pollutes the democratic process where congressmen and senators and the president should be more free to exercise a policy in the wider interests of decency in the world. It, now, in the wider interests of decency in the world, uh, many people have witnessed in the, in the month of August the assault going on in Gaza and have ex been uh, overwhelmed by the lack of uh, condemnation from some of our leaders. I, I'm thinking back to a statement made by Mohammed Abbas in 2012 when he said that uh, I think he was still tending its, to its wounds from the latest Israeli aggression in the Gaza Strip. He said which had wiped out entire families, murdering men, women and children, along with their dreams, their hopes and their futures uh, of living an ordinary life in freedom and peace. He further made the point, and I'm quoting him, the conviction, he said, that Israel was above the law and that it had immunity was bolstered by the failure of people to condemn. There is an irony, isn't it, that this week we're having this free debate and vote again after another assault uh, a year and a half later, which 2,000 mostly innocent women and children and men were killed. Is it fair statement to say that Israel seems to be immune from condemnation? They never know how to underdo it. And I think they would be wise only to treat their neighbour as they would wish to be treated themselves. And only if they approach this issue with that attitude will we end up with two countries living together side by side without the conflict we've seen for so long. The UN General Assembly voted back then, 2012, to, to vote uh, to award the Palestinian Authority with a sort of Vatican-style non-member observer mm. status, giving it a right to sit on various UN bodies and to pursue claims through the International Criminal Court, which it has threatened to do unless the Security Council sets a three-year deadline. That was then uh, for Palestinian statehood. Some have recently said that in the wake of the recent assault, uh, which provoked allegations of war crimes from the UN Human Rights <coughs> Council, that an international criminal trial should be welcomed would that be a good thing? Well, it would, of course, be very inflammatory, and I'm not advocating that today. But that is where things will be going if they don't behave better to their neighbour. But I think the whole point of my argument yeah. is it goes back fundamentally to whether the continuing annexation of Palestinian land is right or wrong, and I consider it to be wrong. And that is not acceptable for Israel to continue to build settlements. I think um, Peter O'Born in his Telegraph piece hinted that probably the, one of the most uh, important, I'm going to be soft on the way of reporting this, one of the most important statements made by William Hague during his term as foreign minister was to say that if 
uh, state has not been achieved through Kerry's um, uh, remarkable whirlwind initiative, uh, then, then there was essentially uh, no hope of a two-state solution. Um, and uh, has Williams Hague's statement made last year now become a reality? If progress in, on negotiations is not made uh, uh, by now, is the two-state solution dead? And what are the possible alternatives to this? No, I don't think it's dead, but it is, of course, um, impeded by the continued expansion of settlements. Uh, and those settlements are wrong. And we should not just see this in terms of uh, a negotiation and an outcome which goes this way or that way. It has to be seen in terms of what is right and what is wrong. And no amount of lobbying and no amount, no volume of political donations can turn wrong into right. We, we have to reflect on the fact that we've been having this debate for many decades. The problem of israeli policy and conflict has been going on for over 60 years. Even if we accept that this, the, the two-state solution is not exactly dead, it is becoming increasingly, as you put it, less feasible as more and more settlements are announced and more land grab is embarked upon. Is one state solution completely out of question? I mean, I know it was suggested that this would mean Israel giving up its commitment to a Jewish state and would alternatively lead to the creation potentially of a, a more blatant apartheid state in which the majority were Arabs but only Jews were entitled to vote. Um, can you actually envisage a solution other than a two-state that would lead to recognition and just sovereign ambitions of the Palestinians as well as Israelis? No, I can't see that. I can't see that a one-state solution is feasible. I think it would contain within itself uh, a recipe for permanent conflict, whereas two states living together side by side could contain a good recipe for permanent peace, and that's what I'd like to see. Now, you've stated uh, that it is important not to conflate Israeli public opinion and the public opinion of the Jewish community more widely with Israeli government strategy. Um, how significant is that? I actually think that if they were really to be free to be open and say what they thought, most Israelis, and certainly most of the Jewish community in the United Kingdom, would admit that settlements are wrong and that they are likely to lead to further insecurity for Israel. But I think that a lot of those voices are smothered by the nature of, if you like, sort of more nationalist politics in Israel. And that's why we as politicians have a duty to speak up so we can give voice to those who at the moment uh, feel they don't dare say what they think. Just in the last week or so, we've seen uh, Sweden taking mm. a very bold initiative mm. of supporting or recognising, publicly recognising and officially recognising Palestine. Do you, are you hoping that the UK could take a leap from that and that, that we will see something akin to that coming from the UK? Or is that just so totally unrealistic a prospect? I would like to think that that's where we could go, and good for Sweden. I hope that the vote in the House of Commons will push things a little bit in that direction. Uh, but in the end, it's about political leadership. And we've got to make sure that we are free to lead as we wish without undue influence uh, from a lobby. Now, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office have spoken quite openly about their aspirations for the Palestinian Authority to again uh, becoming the insurgents across <coughs> Gaza and the West Bank. And there is an inherent uh, prospect of Hamas being uh, taken out of the equation as a consequence. Is that a position that you think is fair and reasonable, especially given that Hamas in the last election were democratically, democratically and overwhelmingly voted into power there? And possibly may still carry that same level of support from the public. I'd like to see the Palestinian Authority have legitimacy across uh, the entire area of a putative uh, Palestine. Um, their commitment to non-violence, their readiness to have a demilitarized Palestine, uh, their having proven already that they are capable of governing in the interest of their people in a proper way, uh, means and I would say this, that there's no reason to stop them getting statehood. And Hamas, of course, must relinquish any kind of uh, animosity to uh, Israel. They must relinquish their determination to destroy Israel. It's totally unacceptable. And they put themselves outside any kind of fitness for government until they do that. So they must renounce violence. Um, but in the end, 
Palestinian land belongs to Palestine and they should be allowed to govern themselves, be recognised and become a state. Now, I, I totally would form the opinion that you would uh, not necessarily put your head so far above the parapet that you may well have taken uh, a, a sort of sense of feeling from our government, from our Prime Minister, on where he stands on this issue. Uh, do you think that you have a good chance that uh, David Cameron and his cabinet could uh, modify, I mean, we've seen some statements coming out recently, could modify the, the whole outlook and, uh, and start to uh, make noises, importantly, to the United States in terms of the way it's currently supporting uh, and endorsing the activities of Israel? I'd like to think that on the back of our history in the region under the British mandate, and with our sense of the region more widely across the broader Arab world, we should be prepared, if necessary, to diverge slightly from the United States. And I think that if we don't make a clear stand, as the United Kingdom, in saying what we believe and what we think should happen, I think that will diminish our reputation and effectiveness in the region uh, in the years to come. So I think that we are probably, with the last generation of people in the Arab world who look to the United Kingdom as a, a sort of informed and benevolent uh, influence, and we could flunk it. Now is the time not to flunk it and to make sure that the reputation of the United Kingdom remains as strong as it deserves to be. And w will that mean, I think as Desmond Swain was sort of hinting this morning, will that mean a total cessation of of the UK's international aid to the region. Uh, he, I think he said that we can't go carry on in rebuilding Gaza and rebuilding West Bank after. Uh, I'm sure Desmond Swain will not have said we're going to terminate our aid to the region. The Department for International Development, indeed when I was in there as his predecessor, has a very proud and determined record of assisting the PA uh, and Gaza, of course, through UNRWA, and I'm sure that's not going to stop. And I think that the United Kingdom can be very proud that we've done that so consistently and for so long. Sir Alan Duncan, Government Special Envoy to Yemen and Special Envoy to Omen, thank you very much for a very lucid exchange and for joining us yet again on Islam Channel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you. Thank you.